Hi, gentlemen. How you doing? Doing good. Welcome, everybody, to episode three. We've got a lot in our minds. My name is Stevie B. What's going My, on? Uh, our, our co-host. Kel's right here. Am I supposed to introduce myself? No. I'm sorry. Let's- and our special guest, uh, good friend of ours. He is a po- fellow podcaster. He is a filmmaker. He is a meme god. Documentary or, God. Tell him who you are. Um, I'm Matt Dixon. I like long walks on the beach. Um, I drive a 2004 Toyota Camry in white. Um, please come visit me at Children's Programming on Instagram. CHI Programming everywhere else. Um, I'm here for the people, and I'm here to tell you what's on my mind. So, real quick, before we get into nonsense and you know, whatever topics, um, tell everyone about, t- tell me, tell us, tell the audience, what are the projects that you're working on? So children's programming is your podcast. Yes, that is my podcast with my good friend, Nick Parodies. That's what we're doing right now during quarantine. We were doing that before, but, um, it's a little easier just to do the podcast right now. Um, on top of other things, um, we're also working on a documentary about the return, hopefully, of rst video better known as the video store from clerks and what is the name of that that is uh we haven't had a official title but you can follow us at rst doc on instagram that's where we post most of our updates and things like that there's no uh like phantom working title like i don't don't know if it was the marvel movies that did it but there's uh they, they like list movies as like um, Forrest Walker or something, but it's really like Captain America three. They just don't want to give you the title of like, like they want to hide yeah. everything. I mean, we've been calling it like I have the title on the thing as the Great American Video Store. That's like one of the titles ideas I had. Um, I'm still trying to think of what could connect to it because the story is changing a little bit behind the scenes. So, mm-hmm. not sure what I'm going to have to name it because um, let's just say that um, quarantine has not helped the reopening process at all so mm, no right uh, yeah so are there any aspirations for this like um i mean it's, festivals it's gonna be a short wanna... film so we're gonna probably bring it to festivals and things like that when it's done and you know you know i really just wanted to make it as a as a my first documentary project post-college because i really enjoyed that part of um, your... what's that sure I was going to say, it's your passion project. It is my passion project right now, as Chris Kelly knows. Yeah. Chris Kelly is, of course, on the crew. He's our illustrious sound man on the, uh, on the set there. So um, it's a fun time. It really is. I thought he was the intern. He is the intern, yeah. but we, we like to give him coffee. a title because it makes him feel better about himself. Of course. Got to have yes. a title with something. You better put this on your resume and you list uh, <laughs> Matty Dix as one of your fucking references. Of course. Oh, I'll give you a great reference. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I think something that I've seen as you've moved from um, Ock and the new media department to obviously New Pulse and then put uh, taking on this project is I know we talked about kind of like where you wanted to go in the field mm-hmm. and everything. And I feel like, you know, you were looking for like an outlet and like a a way to go with it. And I, I feel like watching you over the course of all the interviews and everything, I feel like that was a really that has been a really good outlet for you. And you've kind of figured out at least something that you love to do. And you also are doing it about something that you're very passionate about with Clerks. I mean, not everybody can get a movie that is so um, iconic and literally like be a couple steps away from one of the creators of it. And I think that's just been really cool to watch over the course of what you've been been, doing. It's just been really cool that all the people involved in it are like such nice people. Like Mm -hmm. it's not often you see people from one of your favorite films that are just so accessible because we are pretty close to Jersey. So most of them were not well known from the start so that they're all pretty much, you know, within, within an arm's reach now. Um, but uh, so far I haven't had any, any real issues with any of the cast or anything, trying to get interviews and things like that. So 
it's just nice to see that I'm able to interact with people that are, you know, I've seen for years and now I'm like, oh, I'm five feet away from this person or whatever, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, as of right now, just distant, but. And then it's, like, it's, it's also kind of nice to see how like the people that you idolize are these like nice people. And it's mm-hmm. not like where you have your dreams crushed and yeah. it's like, oh, you've had these un- people on a pedestal. I know obviously they're just people too, but it's also like right now you're, you're interacting with them. You know, they're, they're giving up their time also to help you out and things of that nature. And it's just been, it's been cool so far. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it. No, I appreciate it. I mean, the Kevin Smith uh, fandom is really like, you know, it's really like a cult, you could say, because a lot of us are tend to be very like uh, strange and we obsess a little too much than we should. But you guys have interests like that. You, you'll yeah. you obsess about your, your Nick sucking every year. And, you know, it's, <laughs> yes. it's, um, it's just nice that the fandom has been so opening and uh, understanding to this whole project. And, um, you know, um like you said like when you when you always say you don't want to meet your heroes i mean mm-hmm. I, I met my hero and he was everything i expected him to be and more and um i'm just can glad I ask, yeah can i ask, i was gonna say can i ask what where what was the first thing like you saw from kevin smith was it clerks was it something else like, yeah what um put you to like yo this i like what this guy does he's a great human you know like i saw clerks for the first time when i was probably 14 or 15 at the time um and i didn't really like it that much hmm. at the time because i don't think it's i would, a, i don't think i was in the right mindset to watch it at the time it's not really something mm-hmm. that a, yes. a young kid really can appreciate yeah and then mm-hmm. i got my first yeah, i got my first job you know working at a, at a wendy's okay. and um you know after a while shout you, out wendy's. yeah shout out to wendy's uh not really but i did not enjoy working there <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> But, you know, working at a job when you're you're kind of dealing with the public, you kind of understand the jokes a little bit more. And as I got older, I kind Absolutely. of I kind of understood finally why why that movie was so significant to me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, going through his filmography over and over again now, it's just like everything that he's done in his career just inspires me all the time just because of how he's one of the really few like truly independent directors there are. I mean, there mm-hmm. are very few directors that you can say were able to make a movie in the place that they work and have mm-hmm. basically kept right. that sort of traditional way of making movies throughout their entire career. Like, obviously, he's a very mainstream director now in the general sense. Like, he's well known in the, you know, the nerdy culture. But, you know, I think that tr- that old style of him just doing whatever he wants has always been prevalent throughout his entire career. It's kind of oh, funny yeah. that you say you didn't like it at first because I feel like that's not in the movie aspect, but in music aspect for me, when I usually hear like an album, I usually hate it at first. And then like, as I continue to listen to it, then it grows on me. And and I think like, if you ever asked me if I would have thought that you hated or not, sorry, not hated, but just didn't appreciate it at first, knowing what I know now, I'd be like, no, the first time you saw it, he probably was like head over heels over it. Yeah, it's surprising to me that I didn't like it as much thinking about it back now because it's, you know, it's my second favorite movie as always mm-hmm. cuz Shawshank is my favorite. It stays yes, right there above the TV every night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's just a movie I've always loved. You know, I've always had an appreciation for it, but Clerks always has a special place in my heart as my favorite my actual favorite movie, but, you know, it's still number 2. Mhm. Uh can I ask you what's a movie you hate? A movie Not I hate from Kevin Smith, just in general, like off the top of your head, you're like, oh, I fucking hate. Like people like this movie, that fucking hate this movie. Yeah, um, I mean, like, what's you know, one that like really irks you? I could give you my legitimate answer, which is I don't like Tusk, which is a Kevin Smith movie. Okay. I could also give you that okay. I don't like Wes Anderson movies. I don't like Christopher Nolan movies, and I don't like. Um, <gasps> Whoa, I don't whoa, I don't whoa. I don't hate them per se. I just hate the um fandom that has evolved around them. I, I find okay. them to be I very that fandom, buddy. Yeah, I, I that find fandom. them to be very hipsterish, very pretentious, and this is everything <laughs> I am, but you know, it's just something that irks me a little bit. But to give you the real answer, it would be um I saw Tusk, Kevin Smith's uh 
third to last film and it's it it it's just bad it's it's such a <laughs> i don't like horror movies and i don't like you know torture porn types of movies and it just it, it traumatized me when i first saw it like we when we worked at the movie theater back in the day we we had the option we could either watch the there was a night that they let us all come and watch a movie and it's like we, you could watch the maze runner or you can watch kevin smith's new film tusk mm-hmm. and i'm like okay i'll i'll go do that because why not and it was just me and two other of my friends. And I think somebody walked out at some point. They're like, I just like, I have to go. I I, I can't do this. Because um, the movie's very like, the first half is very like deceiving. And then you get to that middle point where that one thing happens, not to spoil it. But, um, and it just. It, I got to see this movie now. It, it traumatized me. And I, I, I refuse to see it ever again. And I insist it's my least favorite movie ever just because of how. Just out, just no, just, I can't, I can't do it, so. Now, what's, what's your favorite Christopher Nolan movie? <laughs> I mean, I'm not a big on Christopher Tread Nolan. Tread lightly. I, I, I saw Interstellar in the theater four times. Um, that's Thank you. So like, do you like Interstellar? Yeah, it's a great movie. Oh, Christopher Nolan's a great director. Okay, right. I just, I don't, I don't hate Christopher Nolan. I hate his fans. That's fine. Because I think they're all. I'll, I'll accept that. Yeah. I'll accept that. I don't. Well, yeah, I do. I don't like Wes Anderson because I think he's a pretentious bastard. But that's another. That's another story in itself. But <laughs> shout out Wes Anderson. Yeah, come at me. Yeah, like I don't hate him. I, like I don't actually hate him. <laughs> he's he's actually, actually one of him. our listeners, so you should probably oh, yeah, sure, walk definitely. that back. He's, he's going to be right here to to talk to us about this. Episode four, we'll have Wes Anderson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just like I don't have any I don't have any issue with the guy personally. I just don't like the same thing with Christopher Nolan. I just find his films to be very pretentious and I find his fans to be very pretentious. And Is um, there any movie that you like but you know is like a crappy movie? A like movie for that me, I like and know it's crap. For for me, I really think that John Carter came out at a bad time because it came mm-hmm. out and it rivaled Interste- um, uh, Avatar. Yeah, but like some of the graphics were just a little cheesy and stuff. But I think it could have been like a better movie. But mm-hmm. I saw it an IMAX because I like, I had to spend like three hours in the Palisades for I forget why. So I was just like, oh, John Carter's playing. Let me go see it. And yeah, like it's an entertaining movie for me, but it's like not the greatest thing. But I still like can throw it on and enjoy it, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure. What the fuck is John Carter? Exactly. Um, About what? It came out uh, in 2012, it's a movie? not 2009, it's a... by the way. It wasn't okay. Avatar. It was something else. Oh, okay. Was it? Yeah, 2012 would have been... Well, I just yeah. feel like because it was like the same yeah. type of movie kind of thing. Yeah, it's the same type but of movie. Um... The, the movie premise is that there's a par- parallel between Earth and Mars, and this character gets transported to Mars and then kind of uh, wants to stay. But it, it yes. goes through a bunch of different things. I don't, I don't see it being the greatest movie. It's kind of like the Lone Ranger, like that sort of vibe. I've never, I've never heard of this. Okay, I've never heard well, of John Carter. Look it up. It's uh no, I've never seen it no, either. I'm, I'm googling it right now. I forget the actor's name, but um, he was also in. Uh, I'm trying to think. Taylor, yes, Kitsch. Yeah, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Yeah, he was in a bunch of other movies. Um, I'm trying to think. Not that that helps at Going all. Going off of my list of favorite movies, because I always throw a random one in there. That's like, oh, that was pretty good. Um, hmm, a bad movie that everybody thinks is bad, but is actually a great movie. Like, like Chris loves Sharknado. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. That's a, di- at all. that's a different kind of of love. I don't I? I don't. I love Birdemic. Do you like The Room? Oh, phenomenal <laughs> who movie. Do- who doesn't? Tremendous. Who doesn't like that movie? <laughs> if you don't, you don't have taste. Yeah. Yeah, like movies like that are more like the it's the the cult behind it. It's the cult behind it that makes it special. Like I can't think of a movie where I like literally everybody hates that I love off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. Throw some out there and I'll see if I can I can think of one. 
I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I asked the question, and then I was like, if someone asked this to me, I would have no fucking answer for this. So I yeah. apologize for even asking you. My Which way question? of watching movies now. Do you is... have a movie that you love that everyone hates? Oh yeah. Do you have a movie you hate that everybody loves? Um, I mean, I hate Titanic. I think it's overrated trash. Do you? I'll tell you um, what. I watched it. Um, wait, which movie did you just say? Titanic. Oh. James Cameron. Yes. My boy Leo. Yes, Leo is a phenomenal. Um, I watched that again, like, beginning of quarantine. Like, mm-hmm. maybe like in April, somewhere around there. And uh, I enjoyed it more than the last time I watched it. Maybe because, obviously, like, I'm older and I appreciate it better. I like the aesthetics of the film a lot. You know, I think it looks nice, but, I mean, teach your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it it's, is it's really just put on a pedestal. I mean, it was it was obviously one of the biggest movies of its time. I, I believe it was the longest running movie in theaters ever. Before Avatar, um, right? Yeah. I believe it, it ran for like over a year. I love how um, he beat his own record. Yeah. Yeah, that's just what he does. Um, hmm. Another another would be probably... Um, everybody loves The Dark Knight, but I, I understand. Like, it's a great movie. But again, it's like one of those things like I wouldn't rewatch it all the time. Like, it's a visually stunning movie to look at and it's a great story. But like, it's not... It's just not for me. I mean, I have it. I mean, I I enjoyed it because uh, I I don't know. Like, I'm, I was a big I'm, I still am like I'm a big Batman fan, all that kind of stuff. And like, I thought it was really cool because it was a more like darker comic book movie mm-hmm. compared to everything else that was out at the time. But I wonder if it would still have like this mystique kind of around it if Heath Ledger hadn't passed away. You know what I mean? That definitely uh, that definitely impacts it. I think, but. You know, I think he st- he still had a he would have still had a great um, Oscar season after that whole situation, even if he was still mm-hmm. alive. I think he would have still. I, I don't think he would have had much as much of a push to win an Oscar that year, but um, his mm-hmm. performance was just so great. I think it would have just you know made his career even bigger than it was at the time. Mm. Did he do a movie after that before he, before he died? I think that was his last movie, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. All right. Uh. All right. So, Kels, what what did you want to talk about today? You you said you texted me topics? some topics to talk about with. What was that? Texting. Pretty I mean, depressing. Matt, you want to touch on the the Mets sucking? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I know you guys are Jets fans, so you you understand my pain. Um. Mm-hmm. They just lost to the Marlins uh, yesterday, yeah, and puts... the Marlins have had a week off because they were in quarantine, and they just mm-hmm. they just continue uh-huh. to suck. I mean. You know, this could be my therapy session. I really, uh, I really need it sometimes. Lay it on us. The thing about this whole thing is, I saw somebody make this point: like the meth sucking is just about the most normal thing that could happen during this time. <laughs> just because of how, like, it's you like, know, everything's going wrong right now, <laughs> right. and Cons- the meth consistently just they've being, been sucking. Them just being the hugest disappointment is just, you know, it's just icing on the cake. Of it's just like it's normal now. It's it's just everything's going back to normal because the Mets suck. Um, Nature's healing. Yeah, it's, it's almost mean, calming that you know that they're still sucking. That you're yeah, like, oh, I mean, it's, there's some you see some you see normality to, to all this craziness. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing what's going on with um, this closer that they got from the the Mariners with um, with Cano, and the guy they traded for him is now this like top ten prospect, and could end up being like a Mike Trout level star. Like that's just the Mets way of doing things. They always trade people before before they get to their peak or when they could be potentially great. Or they just sign free agents that were great before but then never then never make it to what they were. You're For, telling us and then those The Jets are the Chris. same thing. We just traded away Adams, so we kind of have that soft spot and I mean he was a prima donna about it anyway, so I think that was gonna happen. I don't away. care. I don't care. He's he was a he was a hell of a player, so he he earned that right to talk for me. We could talk about that. I mean, I don't I don't uh, agree with you at all. Okay, I think you're a professional I, athlete, I, I and mean, you need to have a certain level of respect for the team that you know drafted you. And you know, despite even even how great of a talent you are, you're just a safety. You're not anything more than that. Um, I don't think he deserved that much of a paycheck, and he's probably not going to get one no matter with what team he goes with, because I don't think anybody's going to pay $18 million for a safety. 
Um, and I, I just don't like when players have to act like that in public. Like, I get you're a great player, but that doesn't give you the right to act like a prima donna, personally. See, I like the cockiness in, in sports. He likes the drama. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess we'll call it drama, but I just like the cockiness. I don't know. I, I just thought it was just kind of asinine on both ends where it's like he's your best statistically and like if you want to go by statistics or just by the eyeball test he's your best defensive player that you've drafted since Terrell Rebus so I mean obviously there's salary caps and you can't you know you gotta put some money in certain places and like you said spending 18 million dollars on safety maybe isn't the smartest thing but if you build your way in a certain team maybe you can make it work but then that being said like one, if the guy is really that good, give him the contract extension, make him play this year out, you know, do do right by the player who's playing well for you. But at the same time, like you said too, there was a certain, you know, you hold your you know, your your level of composure and your professional professional professionality, is that a word? Your professionalism. Yeah. There it is. Hello. And then uh you know, uh but so then I'm just glad we got two first round picks that we can blow, you know, and just <laughs> yeah get absolutely fucking T- up typical Two death fashion so question yeah, for you yeah, load them up load them up qu- question for you dixon how yeah. did you feel about cespedes opting out literally like just just i'm I gonna mean, just go home i mean cespedes is is a weird guy i mean since he got here he that was probably one of the best trades they've made in in a long time was getting him because the guy they traded him for didn't end up becoming anything. I think he won the rookie of the year the following year, but he's just kind of fallen off. Mm-hmm. And then he basically helped us make it to the World Series that year. Obviously, you know, closer blew it up every game and we lost. But um, after that, he's pretty much just become a money pit. I mean, I feel like he hasn't mm-hmm. contributed much since then. And he's just been kind of a, a – I think he's been kind of a waste in the locker room because he's been injured so much and – you know, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't set a good vibe when your team is doing bad and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's COVID and we have to leave. Like when a week before you were tweeting about how you were excited for the season to start. Yeah. I, I thought it was just so funny that this is one of my favorite, like, because there's no sports going on right now, basically. This is one of my favorite things in sports right now is that he was just kind of like, no, nothing to any of his fellow players, nothing to Brody Van Wagen in it. It's just... Uh, you know what? I'm packing all my things and I'm leaving and I'm telling nobody. And then, like security had to go to his room to find out that he was gone. And then people are going and seeing him in a mall the next day, like just <laughs> just around shopping. There's a there's a baseball meme page that I follow, and the guy who runs the page ran into Cespedes at a mall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? And it's like yeah, that's a little that's that's a bad look. I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> But so I don't even so think funny, I don't think man. he's even been the biggest disgrace of the team. He's just kind of weird, and you know, it's nothing yeah. I expect from him. It's it's nothing that I don't expect from someone like him. It's just like a normal occurrence. You're like, yeah, oh, I mean, okay, this is how it is. You're not really a Mets fan if you're expecting something to go right. It's just not how it is. <laughs> is there? Anything... Well, he was your DH. He, he was supposed to be your DH, and he really wasn't hitting well to start the season, right? Wasn't he striking out quite a bit? No, he actually hit a home run like the first game or two. But I think mm-hmm. I think the fact that they were just being really terrible as they are right now um, just kind of lessened his interest in, in staying. And uh, but it's kind of hypocritical hard. that he was complaining about the whole coronavirus thing, but then he was hanging out in a public mall. Yeah, was he wearing a mask? Yeah. Do you know? Um, I would assume so. I would hope so, because if, yeah. if he cares about Corona and then he's out not wearing a mask, then that would be the hypocritical part. That would be a bad look. But um, what do you feel about the MLB season? Do you think it's going to finish off? Do you think I don't it's going to finish. End? Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, I feel like there's gonna, too many what's factors. What's going to happen is it's not going to be fair, because if you're going by winning percentage as far as who gets into the playoffs, you're going to have a team like the Marlins who have missed a week of games and then... You know, maybe that team who's been playing most of their games is like a few ticks short. And then it's, I, I just don't think it's going to be fair enough to let, you know, to run the playoffs like that. Mm-hmm. Um, like their winning percentage is so much better because they had missed like half the yeah. season. Yeah, like you're going to get a team like the Marlins or the Phillies who are going to get into the playoffs, maybe not with a great team, but they have a better winning percentage than, say, the Brewers, who maybe just might be on the cusp. 
So. Yeah, we've... But because they've played more games, they have more losses. Yeah. So then they're saying now they're not as. Yeah, it's it's like it, it's right, it's yeah. just going to be a really messed up season. I I really don't think it's going to finish because I'm just waiting for one team to. We won three out of six games, but we're still fifty percent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's going to come. Like I just don't trust the players to be honest. After this whole debacle that went with the contract disputes and just how much prima donnas baseball players are, then I think they're the most prima donna of any other league just because of how strong their union is that does i'm not knocking them for having a strong union i just think they're very entitled Mm -hmm. compared to other compared to other leagues in my opinion well is that uh i mean go to go back to what your podcast was on with finkel yeah and kind of hearing him talk about some of the things that the nhl players were doing and stuff and that was kind of interesting because that's some things that you don't know um but i feel like yeah like he said um, the NHL and the MAA have done it kind of correctly. And it's hard. I mean, can you get that many baseball players or that many football players in one area? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think football, there's too many players and too many teams to really. I mean, I have think the thing with the NBA is that they're at the end of their season, really. So the only teams you're going to have to worry about are the teams that are in the playoffs. I mean, I know yeah. 95% of the NBA makes it to the playoffs, but. Mm-hmm. Um, I just <laughs> except the Knicks, yeah, except the Knicks, of course. Um, but I I think it's working for the NBA just because it's the end of the season. I mean, we'll see how the NHL works. I mean, they seem to be doing well with it because, like, like Steve was saying, uh, um, they seem to have like a bunch of um pictures of around of their around of their families and their kids, so they have you know something to look forward to. And you know, I'm sure at some point they'll allow like you know monitored or not monitored visits, but like where they can. They can at least see their kids and, and things like that. Um, and I think it's really up to the responsibility of the players and their families to stay quarantined themselves so they can have those privileges. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is one player is going to ruin the whole thing. Because one player is going to yeah. go out to a party or one guy wants to go get wings at a strip club and it's just not going to, you know. Hey, he's got, I, I, listen, he's I hear got those the, wings are phenomenal. The, okay. the wings are named after him. Shout out Magic City. Yeah, Steve. I really think you need to bring back Operation Chow to go to the, get these wings. Oh my God! All right, call up Digert. <laughs> yep, we're going to Magic City, baby. I'm sure he would love it. So, <laughs> I mean, I That's think just, I think I, it's. I don't know how he would. He's yo. He's he's uh he's in a relationship now. I don't know if I could take him to a. Uh, but this is Eric Digert we're talking like about. That. What do you mean? You're just getting wings. What what else would it be? Of course. It's wings, and then you know, like, um, yeah, I know half, where you're going with that. I'm, I'm, I don't know what it's like there, so I'm just gonna say half naked women, you know, uh, dancing for, um, currency, you know, you know, that's they're just doing an honorable job. It's you know, it's what they do for a living. You're not doing anything okay. wrong, as long as your significant other knows what's going on and doesn't uh, want to slap you. But you know, I don't know Dagger's situation. I don't know his uh, his love situation, but you know. I think he would Shut do up it. Shut up, yeah. Yeah, Diger. We love Diger. We love Diger around here. But yes. I, th- I, I, I think, I mean, being that obviously it's the first occurrence where this is happening, it's all even a learning experience. And for what it's worth, it's always like it's a test and then they can use this data and see what they can do for the future. I mean, there's always going to be this like 2020 season where it's like, yo, everything got fucked up. But like, where do we go from there? Yeah. I mean, I'm more of a traditionalist, but I, I kind of like a lot of these rules that they're implementing, especially in the MLB. The the one where they have the runner at second in the in the 10th inning. I like that idea. Because mm-hmm. I think baseball's biggest issue is that it's just it's it's too slow of a game compared to the other leagues. Like basketball mm-hmm. and football, there's a lot going on all the time. But baseball's kind of a slow, more... You know, yeah. and especially now that the game's not as as um, prevalent with home runs and things like that, you know, you, you really need right. to, to. Well, go, you go on. Go ahead. You, I was gonna say, as far as like the like, it's a great point as far as the, the attention span. Baseball is like the thinking man's game, you know, which is yeah. great about it. Um, but as far as you in, in per, as far as in person watching basketball and hockey. And probably even like soccer too. Like the game is for the most part constantly going. You know, it's it's you're it's there's not much stoppage time. And then football is if you go in person, you realize that it's I don't want to say a slow moving game, but it's just it's instances. You know what I mean? Like 
this it's like all right third and one and it's a running play and it's done in like like four or five seconds and then so then there's now 45 seconds that they're all gathering up but when you watch it on tv which is you know as millions of people do the presentation is constantly moving you're mm-hmm. constantly seeing something mm-hmm. there's not much downtime where i feel like baseball hasn't found like that niche yet where like I know they're like it's trying to, but like it, there's got to be a, something in the presentation to keep you engaged. You know what I mean? Or I mean, for, to keep the, the attention span, if you would. You know? I think in the post steroid era, it's it's really difficult to have any interest in in baseball because you know after that whole incident with the whole uh, you know with the Mark McGuire home run chase and you know in the post bonds world where he's retired now, there's not as many really big home run hitters as there once was. And I think that was a big push for baseball because people wanted to see records broken. But now yeah. that but now that every baseball record has pretty much been broken for the most part. Um every you know, every major offensive one. And um and how like now the game is more analytical based. Like it's mm-hmm. more of a, a game of it's kinda like more like football. It's a game of inches. Like you're focused on more on, on base percentage and you know your value individually as a player rather than you hitting home runs or getting wins because of how many different things you can do to win a baseball game now uh i see this is where like you you're you said you're a traditionalist and i respect it because baseball is america's pastime you yeah. know it, it was america's sport right now football is america's sport and i think basketball will eventually be that but that being said i am i'm like completely against it you know like i'm i'm in the favor of like listen you let them take whatever supplements, whatever drugs, whatever <laughs> steroids they want. I want everyone looking like Brock Lesnar stepping up to the plate and smacking the shit out of that ball. That's what I want. It's, it's like funny, though, also, because you, like, mentioned, like, the records and everything. You really – when was the last record that was, like, broken? Like, I mean, there hasn't it's been, been a perfect while. game in eight years. The last person to win 300 games was, like, 2009, I think. And I feel like in in basketball, there's always like they're always showing like this little statistic that you may not even know that like is being broken. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, Steph Curry shot fifty threes today, and it's like, oh, I didn't know nobody ever did that before. Well, my guy broke every three pointer record in the course of like two years. So, yeah, right. It's pretty amazing that players like that. It was funny exist. how Ray Allen, Ray Allen's like considered like the best three point shooter like of all time, and like he's got these records and. Steph Curry comes along in, like you said, two, three years, and it was like, bang, 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 just crushed all of them, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, there can still be players like that, I think, in baseball. Like, you have the Mike Trouts of the world where they're, yeah, you know, they still have potential to possibly break the all-time records. But, like, as far as single-season records go, I, I don't think there's really much incentive anymore to break them because they're so difficult. Like, say you wanted and to that's break like, the that's all-time like, oh. single-season strikeout record, that's 383. Very rarely does anybody even come close to 300 these days anymore. So, I mean, and, and the home run record, yeah. because it was in the steroid era, it's a lot more difficult to break now because you have to do it, you know, naturally. And so I don't, what's the record for for home runs? In a season. Is it like 60-something? 73. I thought it was... Oh, it's... Wow. Okay. Yeah. What is it again? 73. 73. But that was Bonds, you know, peak, yeah. peak steroids. Yeah. Yep. Um I I, I just no. <laughs> I don't like the fact that <laughs> that um players have to do that to get an unfair advantage because you're giving a bad image to the younger players that they have to do this particular thing just to be a great player. And you know, we don't know the long term well, we do know the long term effects of steroids overall. You're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get some serious health issues over time might cause roid rage you might have some you know some underlying health conditions that you know break your bones more easier and things like that and Mm -hmm. i just don't like the fact that it it, it's it's giving a bad image to kids that this is what they have to do to be an athlete Mm -hmm. is is steroids what made jose canseco crazy or is that just himself i I it's i mean the guy took steroids for over 20 years i think that might be a contributing factor i mean i don't know the guy's life before that but (laughs) So being <laughs> being a purist, how do you feel about like all of the other scandals that have been prevalent over the years, especially like Houston cheating and everything? Yeah, I mean the last the few scandals after that were you know had, you had the biogenesis steroid scandal um, with A Rod. Mm-hmm. I mean I think A Rod's a tool. I don't really like him that much, but I think he's a knowledgeable baseball Yo, guy. He's, 
He's about to own the Mets, man. Yeah, yeah he might own my team. Them. And, you know, if he helps us win a World Series, then, you know. Then that, so that narrative it. will change. Mazel tov. I love I A-Rod love now. Let's go. <laughs> now, if the Donald owned my team, I'd be a little more concerned. But that's that's never going to oh, yeah. happen. But yeah, um, I just don't think he has enough money to buy the team personally. But it's just like, it's just tacky. I don't like to see baseball players have that sort of competitive disadvantage when you know most players do it do it the right way relatively yeah. you know the quote-unquote right way um you know the other are there are there other leagues where steroids are more prevalent that that make it a better game like i, I feel like baseball is really the only one other than like cycling or something like that or something in the olympics yeah the tour de france became so good once lance started doping yeah yeah it was much better <laughs> I mean, whoever watched competitive cycling before that, right? Yeah, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I have no, no problem I, with I, other people being non-traditionalist, but I hear you because I mean, as a somebody who's competitive and played pretty much just basketball over the years, like you wouldn't want somebody else to have that unfair advantage. And then when you find out that they do. That's why all the overreact not not even overreactions, all the reactions that have happened since are like, no, like you cheated to get there, like there should be an asterisk. Technically you should just be wiped away from it. And then do you feel like there was more of a um punishment for Joe Kelly almost hitting the Astros players than actually the Astros players? who cheated like did you have any reaction on that aspect well the issue with that situation was that the astros players only admitted to that because they were given um what's the word i'm thinking of uh like yeah i know what you mean like, yeah they were given like, like they, they weren't be, gonna they, be they wouldn't be charged punished. immunity immunity yeah, given, like, immunity. they were given yeah. immunity Dipl- yeah. diplomatic so they immunity. wouldn't be charged so um i get why they weren't charged but at the same time it's like i i really think the title should have been vacated yeah, because that would have just told the rest of baseball like, if you do this, you will not get your championship. I mean, it doesn't really change anything. All the players got their money, and I feel like every yeah. player that was on that team that they could found they could have find they could have found evidence on should have been fined and banned for a significant amount of time because you know there's players that are not in the Hall of Fame because they allegedly cheated on sports. Shout yeah. out Pete Rose. Shout out Shoeless Joe. Um, belongs. Yo, to- he never bet on his own team. Okay. No, he never bet against his own team. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good, he's a good honest American. All right. He truly good is. American. I mean, he's a, he's a strange guy. I don't support his some of his life decisions. I read his biographies. He seems like a nice enough guy, but like when him and A Rod were on the Fox Network, they were great. Like that was one of the best duos of like post game coverage I've ever seen. I actually yeah. enjoyed A Rod as a commentator. Actually, yeah, him I mean, and, he's uh, a very knowledgeable guy. Him and Tony Romo, like when they came out and started commentating, they were really like knowledgeable and kind of enjoy. I enjoyed listening to them as opposed to some of the other broadcasters. It seems like Romo is a better broadcaster than he was a player. <laughs> For real, he was like picking apart every play. It's almost like, all right, Tony, we know you're got you. You got the defense, all right? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I, I no, go on. I just kind of felt like the punishment for Joe Kelly was a little bit harsher than you know. Obviously, yeah, they they got the immunity, so they weren't suspended at all. But he got eight games, and then what a lot of other people were saying was in a shortened season, eight games is actually like twenty or yeah. whatever. I, I forget what the number is, but to me, that was like a little bit harsh because I mean. I guess he was targeting them, but at the end of the day, he didn't actually hit somebody. So, to me, you're being, I guess, over... To me, I think it was just... They're they're trying to set a precedent after they didn't already set that precedent. Like, they didn't set a precedent with Houston players cheating, but now they're like, all right, we got to protect them, so we're going to suspend you for the eight games so that nobody else I really think that Joe Kelly was a... um was a he was trying to they were trying to set a standard really like over this whole situation they're trying to make an example of him exactly because this is going to happen so often this year and and really what's going to happen is if if they start starting bench clearing brawls on a regular basis somebody's going to get sick at some point yeah 
because they're. I'll tell you what, I'll tune into baseball a lot more. And then it's yeah, also I mean, you also saw it. You saw it in the preseason where a lot of people were being hit. Yeah, I mean that's just what you expect. Like these, the the players weren't given any any sort of punishment for the whole situation. Repercussions. So I don't. So, some, I don't, so the. I don't cry tears for a team that cheated. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any uh, any relation to Joe Kelly there, Chris? Uh, I'm not going to say. We're going to just uh, let you assume that I am. Mm. Right, so I, I'm assuming yes. Yeah, I'm I, have, I, have, I have very uh, strong... I, I, I've, I enjoyed everything about that moment and his uh, going at Correa, was it? Correa, the, yeah. Yeah, and uh, like doing like the, the baby like crying kind of yeah. thing. Oh, to, dude, to me, that was oh. that's oh, call that's me what, you know all you baseball purists and traditionalists shit on me all you want. That's what the game needs. But let them bat flip, baby. Let them talk shit. Let them let them do all the you know the crying like a baby. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I want now, the celebrations. I'm partially a hypocrite for saying that like oh it's bad for the kids, but when you look at the '80s as far as baseball, it was the oh, Wild yeah. West. I yeah. mean, you got guys drinking in the middle of the game. You got guys with cocaine in their back pockets. You have Daryl Strawberry. I'm pretty sure Daryl Strawberry like had sex with a fan, like a girl from the fans during a game. Like I think that's a real story. I would not be surprised. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, it, it, a lot of sports are, are have changed for the, I guess, what they think the betterment of the sport when a lot i feel like a lot of the fans like the older days when things were a little bit more wild i would say i could be wrong Mm -hmm. that's my opinion like when when there was a lot more fights in the nba you know it was a lot it was a lot better to watch in that aspect because you you know there's, there's people who like the knicks and the bulls like hated each other it was like a specific rivalry and there was a lot more rivalries whereas now they're considered rivalries but you don't feel like that same animosity it's like everybody's handshaking afterwards kind of thing mm. well baseball's I feel like the a last... very white collar sport comparatively yeah i feel like the last like big moment in the nba was like mellow and garnett yeah and i could be wrong on that but that was like the last but i mean i feel like that aspect of it where with the houston i, mean, I feel like it would have gotten it definitely would have gotten out of hand and especially with covid i understand that aspect of it but also let him play. You know, I think we need more malice in the palace in this life. I think we need more of this. Dude. Those. Dude, that was a wild time. Like, I, I think of all the sports, the NHL has really done the best at regulating that because they still allow fights to happen. It's just part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think baseball fights I mean, would be a great addition to the game. Just let it happen. Sometimes you just gotta, like, let out some steam. Yeah, I mean, just not, get, you do it just on the get ice suspended for the, the rest field. of the game. Like, what's it going to do? Like, if you're just fighting all the time, like it's it's not going to hurt the game at all. So, who was the two that fought at second base like two years ago? Was it Jose Batista and? Uh, oh, and um, uh, I forget who. I'll, I'll get to it in a second. You know what I'm talking about, though. Yes, it was. He was on the ti- uh, the Rangers. I'm going to draw a blank on his name. Um, I don't remember, but I, I can I can see I know he was on the Rangers. Right, yeah, yeah, that was great. I loved it. I mean, he was he was one of the more recent guys that just like with the bat flips and all that, and you know, it's it's great. I, I mean, I like it. I enjoy the I enjoy the cockiness when it's when it's warranted. Yeah, like, see, you like the cockiness in it. I don't see? like the cockiness see? when you're Admit taking it. steroids Admit and it. cheating in the Admit game. It. You know. Admit it. No, but I I, yeah, I mean, I don't know why you don't like. I don't know why people don't like bat flips. Like, how is that such a bad thing when you just fucking crush a home run? Because baseball makes is a very no sense stingy, to me. very, like I said, very white collar sport. It's just like it's very traditionalist. It's like that Yankee bullshit that they're, oh, we got to keep everything that we ate was. Don't put your name on the back of the jersey and keep your haircut pristine. Keep the same jersey. It's tradition. Yeah. So, I mean, go on, Steve. I was going to say, speaking on like bad flips and not liking things and. All that kind of stuff. There was uh, Dixon. You also wanted to talk about cancel culture. Yes. Oh yes. So I'm trying to I'm trying to segue a segway, little bit. Segue. Segue. Yes. Yeah. Cancel. What's What's your thoughts on cancel culture? Cancel culture has been uh, bothering me a lot lately, because I feel like this was this was your opinion. Yes, this is my opinion piece. So, 
What do you guys think about the whole thing? I want to get your perspective before I go on. I'm kind of like torn because I understand if you want to call it canceling certain people. Um, I would more phrase it as like replace. Like I think we should do a better job of not letting certain people who have a platform who are like sharing negativity or something that's uh, that's not for like don't let them get so big. Like nip it in the bud to begin with. And then mm-hmm. if somebody gets to the point where they're like, do like their past comes out and they did like all bunch of this sh- crazy shit, stupid shit, um, like thing or like. I think there there can be room for somebody like changing and becoming better and like apologizing for their wrongdoings depending on like what they did. But I think we should replace people who like don't have any anything good with like there's there's a lot of people who are doing good deeds and sharing positivity that don't have that platform that I think that would be better suited. Yeah, I think it's just a really scary time we live in because of how often you see this happening now where, where you come out when you see... It, it seems to be happening a lot with comedians lately where you'll see a, a guy come out and he'll get accused of something. And it's just like, you know, I want to I wanna believe as many people as I can when it comes to that certain thing because there's been a long time where where women and, you know, other people have not been appreciated and have not been mm-hmm. listened to. And yeah. I totally understand that. And I think it's a very important cultural moment for that to happen the issue is where i find is that people feel the need to not forgive people for things like for things that are lesser for like lesser offenses you know what i mean yeah like obviously someone like bill cosby r kelly like you're you've been you you can you can go on now we we don't need to see you anymore but like someone like someone like louis ck where he didn't necessarily assault anybody per se but he more or less you know he might have done some inappropriate things but i feel like he's he's condoned for his sins he's you know he's atoned for his sins rather um as best as he can and you know i just find it i find it hard that some people are so not willing to forgive i understand why people are difficult to forgive but i just i I have a difficult time understanding it i guess it it is a, it's a very uh it's a very um i don't want to call it like a sudden death time that you're in right now because if it's like like you said if you make one i i, I understand it in the sense of like you're teaching uh you have to reframe like what is acceptable in society now mm-hmm. so it's kind of like with the fear of like if i say the exact wrong thing you know i lose if you're a celebrity like uh you know i lose my my sponsorships, my money, you know, all this kind of stuff. But like you said, I, I also feel like as far as like uh, if somebody has done something in the past that's like as far as ra- like racist, um, as far as that, I am not going to – I don't feel like I am qualified to tell anyone – like I am a straight white male in America. I am not qualified to tell people – if their people have made racist comments that they're not supposed to be offended. So like that I'm going to leave alone. Cause that is not my place to tell people what, you know, I, I have no jurisdiction in that realm. Uh, with that being said for other things, uh, you know, let's say a kid makes the big thing. I was actually talking about somebody at work this time too. So now we're me and Chris are a little bit different. So we're, we're 30. So we, mm-hmm. Like, we are literally lived through the evolution of the internet. Mm-hmm. So, like, we went from being on, like, AOL Instant Messenger. So, I'm sure there were things if... I don't know if it's possible if you could pull up all the old AOL Instant Messenger shit that would be super fucking embarrassing. Uh, MySpace, same thing. But, like, those have kind of been, like, deleted and they're not there. Where kids that are younger than us, let's say 10 years younger, instead of doing it there, the, where, you know, that's all wiped from history. As far as I know, watch this. Someone's going to find a way to pull that shit up now. But... Now kids will put things on Twitter. So let's say you put something on Twitter when you're 13 and I'm not, you know, it's, it's wrong. And so now you're getting drafted towards a sport, you know, you're getting drafted into some sport. Let's say you're an athlete. Now they pull up your tweets. So if the tweet is from like 10 years ago, you know, when the kid was 14, 15, 
and now they're 25 or something like that. If they're a different person and they've had the time to change and grow, like you, you have, like you said, you have to give some type of the ability to condone, to change, to be a better person, to you know apologize. You, like you can't just be like you're wiped off the face. You know you're done. Mm-hmm. For instance, the thing with Ellen right now, how she treats apparently all her employees like shit. You know, and her interns and all that kind of stuff. Um, apparently, behind the scenes, she's a real, you know, uh, jerk off. So she's basically getting her show is getting canceled, or she's not real, whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. Ellen's getting canceled. So now, in 10, 15 years, if if she has the opportunity to reflect and to make right on it, and if there's something she could do, she deserves the opportunity to do that. You know. I think it's actually funny because we kind of touched on this last week with our episode with Travis with uh, the whole Nick Cannon um, where he got canceled for the the things that he said. And I don't uh, I didn't like actually look into what he said. And I know there was a lot of things that I read that were wrong about what he said, but him and Deshaun Jackson both had some things that came out that were pretty bad. And then um, what I noticed yesterday was Peter Rosenberg tweeted out Hmm. um and this was a quote. So Deshaun Jackson is out here doing damn near, near Hebrew school, school twice a week. Nick Cannon is celebrating Jewish holidays that I don't even celebrate. And then in parentheses, by the way, I'm happy about this and I appreciate the effort. Dot, dot, dot. This dude from the A's better do something better than sorry, my B. Because I guess he was doing the like the Nazi salute. Like, I think he did it twice during... He some did it, kind like, of... multiple times during the game. And yeah. it was like, oh, I, I didn't... Like, he, yeah. like, said it was an accident. And I was like, how did he accidentally do the Nazi salute? Wait, wait, wait there was, was a guy on the A's that did this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. It was yeah. yesterday, right? I think it was yesterday or day before, yeah. But, like, in those instances, I think what I found is that they've done their, like, research and they've apologized. They've seen that they've caused harm in the, in the, certain, in the Jewish community. And they kind of took that and took that negative and turned it into a positive. And I think if that's the case where you're going to, you know, reflect on what you've done and you're doing your education, you're learning about these instances, then I feel like that's the way you, you learn. I mean, we only know what we know. We can't obviously know more than that. I mean, once you put, put forth the effort to educate yourself, I think then that's the room that we have to grow as humans. Yeah, I think as long as you're as you're making the effort to to correct what you've done and you've made and you've done you know you you made you made promises to yourself like I'm okay I'm gonna I've made this mistake and this is what I'm gonna do going forward and then if you're clear on your intentions and you and you go through with your intentions and you've given it enough time to to heal what you've done and I think it's really important that you know at least people need to consider the fact that people are human and then we need to realize that it can cause a lot of mental health issue over time for Mm -hmm. people who are not as you know not as thick skinned going through things like that and you know i think we just really need to reconsider how how we're able to forgive people i guess i'm trying to say i don't know i think also i mean there's certain things that i can never Kind of like obviously, if you come back somebody, from, if you murder yes. somebody, I'm not going to forgive oh, you for yeah. that. Things like Even that like, are not forgivable. There is definitely like a zone, like, yeah, in, not a zone, but like certain things that like that if you know are ingrained to you, and, and sometimes like you can be like, oh, they didn't have a good uprising, but like it's ingrained into society. Like it, even if your parents don't say it to you, your people you interact with, media, like it's just everywhere in society, like pedophilia, like. No, nope. sorry, man. Yeah. No coming back. You're yeah. a dick. Yeah. Like you're done. You know. And I think even like I mean I know you mentioned Louis C.K. I'm kind of like not like some of his stand up was kind of geared towards that. So if you're saying that kind of stuff and then also doing it for me, that's kind of mm-hmm. like on the fence. And then also like Chris D- Delia, Delia. I can't like he's had instances where he's played like that character. And it's like if you're playing it, that character, and you're also doing it, there's no line like yeah. that's like I don't really I can't really come back from that in this. I case. mean, if if everything that happened with Chris Leah is true, I think it's very creepy and it's something that he really would have to he would have to do a lot of, of reconstruction of his life in order to, to 
you know, to come back from. Um, I yeah. think in Louis' situation, you're very right. A lot of his comedy is geared towards that. Um, I think it was kind of his shtick. But um, the thing with him is I feel like he has made efforts to reconcile with these people that he's hurt. Mm-hmm. And Yes, yeah. I haven't I, actually I, looked at what he's done, so I can't. I I don't know that. Yeah, I think he was doing some inappropriate things to um, not rape, but to a few women. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, he was fucking beating his meat in front of him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there you go. To put it lightly, um, but I I believe he he asked for consent, and in some cases he may or may not have gotten it. And you know, he's I feel like he's acknowledged what he's done, and. You know, maybe he shouldn't be on the same level that he was before of of being obviously, you know, he's not going to be on any major networks or anything anymore. But I think we need to over time realize that the guy made a mistake and this is something that happened, you know, maybe a decade or two ago. And, you know, I think he, he is a prime example of somebody that made a mistake and I feel like has really reconciled with what he did. He's contacted the, the women individually to try to to reconcile and i think that's a really noble thing to do i I didn't know about any of that you know i haven't really Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i I didn't know that he's i think it'll be up to up to them to to them to uh if they forgive him or not mm -hmm. and moving forward i was gonna say it's 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 not up for us to decide for them to forgive him Mm -hmm. and as far as like the talking of reconciliation like like i touched on ellen before or whatever in 10 years, if she just makes a comeback because everyone's kind of forgot about it, but she hasn't done anything to warrant reconciliation, like you haven't apologized, you haven't reached out, changed your behavior, all these kind of things, like, then, you know, like what, you're not a changed human. You don't realize what you did. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's an isolated incident, especially, I think it's it's important. Like, if you, if you reconcile with what you did, and it, it's, like you said, it's completely within within the person's right who it happened to, to not forgive that person. That's perfectly okay. Because obviously we don't know the, the repercussions of what that person might've done. Um, but I, I, I do think it's, it's just really important to consider that we have to, we can't, we, we can't, uh, what's the, what's the word? We can't vilify people as much because remember, you know, human beings are, are fallible creatures. And like I said, we make mm-hmm. mistakes yeah. and, we all do. I think forgiveness is a really important skill to learn, um, especially yeah, a, going into the There's definitely a lot society. of things. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things in my past that I always reflect on, and kind of that's why I am who I am today because things I've looked at and been like, I don't want to keep doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Really deep subject we got into here, boys. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah no nah, that's good combo though it's yeah good combo. no it's just been it's it's really been bothering me lately and just you know it's been on my mind but you guys you also touched on your podcast too because it's like if you have a difference of opinion now it's like okay you're canceled kind of thing yeah and so i don't think like, that's that's the uh i don't think that leaves room for uh growth if it's just if you if it if your opinion is is different like if you can find middle ground if you can kind of see where the other person is coming from and go from there i think that that's how you kind of like i always try to challenge myself with other people's opinions that's why i kind of listen to other things I, i'll try to like read more things into other other opinions but mm-hmm. if i don't i'm not gonna say like oh i agree with it but i'm trying to kind of see where people are coming from that's why I think it's important to have a voice like someone like Joe Rogan these days because a lot of people criticize him for having you know, generally not favorable people on his podcast. Mm -hmm. But I think it's still important to have those conversations with people like that because what's going to happen is if, say you have somebody who's very right wing or somebody who might be borderline a Nazi, something like that, where you're just ignoring their opinion, that's not going to help the situation at all. You're not, for say, you're not giving them a platform, but you're more or less able to work through what you have an issue with as far as their opinions go and Mm -hmm. you can try your best to convince them otherwise what's going to happen is if you don't let these people talk in a normal forum is they're going to just go and sit sit in their little echo chamber and continue building on this this hate that spreads over time 
and I think that's telling. Yeah, there's no telling that they will change. But if you try to, I don't know, like teach them another way, so to speak, then maybe there's room for it. Who knows? There's, I mean, with this, like this whole thing too. Like, I lucked out with the woman that I married in the fact that, like, she is like, and not that I'm not, but like, she is a uh, a cavalier for like LGBTQ. And, um, there's certain things with like, I'll, I'll, I'll go to her. There's the thing where, uh, where people now where they, they, they won't want to be called him or her. They would like them, they or there, I think was the thing. So I said to her, I said, listen, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll go to her and be like, listen, I don't understand, you know, like sit down, talk with me, teach me, mm-hmm. you know, I don't go to her and I'm like, this is stupid, blah, blah, blah. I don't understand why. And I'm like, I'll be like, Jess, tell, educate me. You know what I mean? Because I'm not grasping it and give it to me in a way that I can grasp. And like, I just try to genuinely like sit down and like, look at myself, look at the situation. I'm like, okay. Um, and I, 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 ha- I try to have a difficult conversation and she, I, because I, like I say, I lucked out that she'll just give it to me straight. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I have to sit there, I have to take it and I'm like, but I just try to, like you said, I don't try to sit there in my I, my own echo chamber, and I, I I have her, and I'm like, I need you to to you know, if there's something I don't get, I need you to help me, and I'm willing to talk with you about it. And I'll tell you what, she like God bless her because she's helped me with a, like, not that I was like I wasn't a homophobe or anything like that, but like there was just certain things like I don't, I don't get it. You know what I mean? Like again, I am a straight white male in America. I need help from I I'm I'm having trouble seeing your perspective. Help me see it. And uh, I try to do that with everything, you know. But uh, like you said, if you if you don't have someone to help you with the the conversation, you're just gonna sit there in your own thoughts and your own bad uh, like vibes and things or whatever, whatever, whatever you're melling around in. It's not gonna be good. Like, why do you think that people end up like that, where they're in the KKK or whatever? It's because they're isolated from everybody else because they have differing views and nobody wants to listen to them. I'm not saying you should go out and be listening to KKK members. I'm just saying there was one episode of Joe Rogan in particular that was really interesting. There was this guy who he was the first black man to write a book on the KKK. And he okay. he was able to get hundreds of at least 100 KKK members to leave the organization. He was able to get mm-hmm. presidents of KKK groups to leave the organization just by really? having normal civil discourse with them. Yeah, I think I saw something about In the that. making of this book. And I think that's a very powerful example of what people can do when they don't immediately vilify somebody's viewpoint, but instead listen to why they have that viewpoint and then try to convince them why they shouldn't have that viewpoint. Mm, I mean, right. literally, if you look at Jesus and all the teachings that are about him, like a lot of people wouldn't be hanging out with prostitutes but he was there to kind of you know it's just it's teach it's people different ways to like, have that understanding it's just you have to understand where other people are coming from and if you're going immediately and attacking a person like oh my god that person's canceled immediately or that person their viewpoint is, is garbage like we shouldn't even bother giving them a platform mm. that's not going to make the, that's not going to make the problem any better in my opinion Yeah, you got you got to work. I mean, as far as you said the Deshaun Jackson thing, he made his comments. Um, I don't exactly remember what he said. He quoted something from Hitler, right? Wasn't it? Yes, I believe so. That's a little messed up, right? And but to some Julian Edelman, who is a Jewish football player, reached out to him and said, "Listen, I'm going to talk with him. I am going to work with him. You know, like I think it know, was even like a." I want to say like a 90 year old Holocaust survivor, I think reached out to. And like, I think they had like a conversation and everything. I could be wrong on the actual age and who it was, but I think they were, I know he, I know he taking him on a trip to, to Auschwitz or something. Yeah, I believe so. I yeah. think he accepted yeah, I, that. I, I believe so. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're at a, just about over an hour here. So for the last topic, we're yes. going to get hopefully to sound a little bit lighter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean uh, to bring a dark subject. It's just it's, no, it's on I my mind. No, no, yeah. no, this, that's why we that's why this podcast is like this. And we I want people to I, I fully speak encourage anyone who listens to this who may 
like we said, uh, have a different view. Even like disagree or think we we're uh, we may be off on something. Please contact us. Definitely we'll educate have you us. On. We will, you know, have let's talk. You know, um, side hustles, right? That's what we want to talk about. Mm. Side hustles, secondary jobs, or second jobs, jobs we're doing while we're trying to pursue a different career. That's that. That was like something that I feel like all three of us have that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So, as you three know, I mean, sorry, there's three of us. There's two more. Stupid. As you two know. Um, I do glass work with glass techs. Shout out them. Shout out um, Jeremy. And um, shout out Devin, who's been working. Um, so what I I kind of like... Fuck you, Joey. I, yeah, I mean, Joey moved away. So shout out, all, shout out everybody who we work with and everything. To me, like, I don't know. I haven't always like... I don't think a lot of people know that I do like a secondary which is more like my primary right now while I'm, while I'm pursuing iconic visions. Like that's like a a main portion of an, of my income coming in um, to pay for like school loans, bills and everything else like that. But as far as me, like I, over the years have had like three, four, five different random jobs, you know, trying to make the thing I went to school for and the thing I went, thing I love my passion, like, to pursue that. Um, so I, I, I or right out of college, I worked as a, a porter for two summers um, in downtown NYC down at Battery Park. There was a, a building that we would go and we'd take care of the jobs when the people went on vacation. So we would do like a job for like a week or two while they were on vac- while the, the primary people who were in those positions were on vacation. So there was like janitorial work kind of thing, taking out garbage, sweeping up, mopping, vacuuming, all that thing. So each job kind of like you learn different things on different jobs. You meet people, you network as always. Um, I had work in cabin cabinets. Um, I did work in I was an editor as well um, for a time period with uh, Push Story. Shout out them. Shout out Ray. I know he's uh, he, he's tuning in every now and then. Um, and definitely like we, I feel like the work that we want to do sometimes is like an interesting career because it's like, do you need a, do you need a, a degree for it? Do you not? Is it who you know kind of thing? And then it's also like a lot of like success stories. You see that they're becoming successful a little bit later on life and they had all these other odd jobs so i kind of think it's like an interesting thing that if you keep like pursuing what you want to do and this is like how i feel like i'm, I'm going to keep doing what i love and eventually hopefully i'll get to where i want to i'm never going to like stop pursuing this even if i'm like up to 80 and i finally make it that's my success story but i don't know if you had any input or any thoughts on on like what you do versus like what you want to do kind of thing. Well, unlike you, I've never been able to really make a living on what I do <laughs> mm-hmm. on the things I enjoy. Um, I'll, I'll talk about like why I think I, I have a hard time doing that is because I, I have this, this fear that I'm going to get to get my opportunity to do something in the field. And then I'm not going to know enough about what I need to know about. And that's really what scares me in this field is it's a very mm-hmm. like because there's so many people going into it and there's so many like you know more detailed transitions and music and you know motion graphics that people are able to do these days it can be a very intimidating thing to go into when you're kind of you mm-hmm. know interested in like smaller things i guess i'm trying to say so like I find a lot of anxiety creating my podcast because I'm thinking like you know I want to do very I want to do all these things like I want to make you know teasers for episodes and I want to do this this and that but I'm like one person and then I have to do my regular job you know nine to five every day yeah it, yeah it's interesting because you always have like all these bright ideas kind of thing and then it's mm-hmm. like what do you do at this time what do you shelf for possibly later or like how do you have the means to pay your bills while also kind of doing what you love and making everything work in between. Because I mean, there there's 
especially with right now with COVID and everything, where it's like kind of like this is at a standstill. I mean, I feel like the podcast is great because we could do it from our own houses, kind of mm-hmm. thing, and still gain audience. And there's certain things that you can do, but it's also kind of limited right now as far as like the major like motion pictures and all that industry. So I, it kind of like turned everything on its head. And like, it's a lot less traditional now because you see like certain interviews are like this, like in bubbles, like you see Zoom calls and stuff in like, like on Netflix, there was a, a Hamilton, um, like a, a speaking with like the directors and the cast and they're all in little squares from, from Zoom calls. And it's like, for me, it kind of released like the, the traditional aspect of it where you don't have to be as pristine all the time it's more the message where i enjoyed watching that because it's something that i want to learn more about like why they did this how they did that aspect of it and i didn't need the presentation to be perfect and i feel like right now it's kind of like a good time to 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 try new things while also trying to keep yourself safe so um it's just an interesting time and we also there's a lot of Sometimes there'll be people who like will work for a certain amount of time and they have to make that amount of money that they earned over that time, like last, like the whole year. Like if you're out of work for a little bit, you know, you kind of have to budget and, and still pay bills, but it's like a constant grind where you're just working almost 24 seven on ideas, on, you know, brainstorming different things that you want to do. And also, like, finding time for regular life, people, friends, you know, romances, all those other things. I think that's a not a bad advantage, but you're, you're one of the one guy who kind of can just do whatever they want because you're not locked down as much. That's very true. I um, mean, not a bad I, that thing. is not an aspect right in. now. No, no. I mean, obviously, I'm still searching where I'm not, like... Like that's that's something that's on my mind in in that aspect because as I get older, kind of that that's something that I want to find. But it's also it I understand when other people have to segment segment time, which is not a bad thing. That's something that you prioritize. Definitely, it's it's a constant uh, like a juggling act, I guess if you would. Um, and like to those to someone who has. I will never knock somebody for taking a job that maybe they don't want to take yeah. because no, it gives them secure security and payment. It gives them health insurance. It gives them stability, you know, and then they can build because you can say, follow your dreams and there's multiple dreams. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you could want to be an aspiring uh, filmmaker, but you could also want, you know, like a family and a house and yeah. those things are dreams too. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, some people will say like, listen, like maybe like you said, Kels, like maybe like when I'm older and I, I, I got to establish these things, like I can get, I hopefully can get back to that one day. Um, so I know people that have taken jobs and they miss necessarily don't, it's not their dream job, but they're on the other end of their life. You know, the other, the other half of the scale, they're able to provide for their kids. They can, you know, they can take a vacation. They can, you know, drive a, not like a, like a nice car, not like a, um, a Land Rover, but they can, you know, buy a car that's reliable and other certain things. Like it supplies other things in their life that they can do. Um, but, you know, at the same time too, I will never knock somebody for uh, not trying to lock themselves into a job and then they can't, you know, chase like their passion, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's everyone's, you know, pursuit of happiness in their life. And, um, you know, I've worked at the same restaurant now for, it's going to be 10 years. Uh, but I've also like in that time, you know, I tried to, I, I got married, you know, I went back to school and I got another, uh, two year degree. Yep. Um, I got two jobs, but I kept, I never quit the job that, and let me tell you, there's days I loathe this job. I hate it, mm-hmm. but it, it gives me like that stability like that guaranteed like if god you know worse things worse you know if uh if the tire gets blown out of my car i can i can i can repair the car you know i'm not in, i'm not in a, such a huge pinch you know um but as far as dixon for what you said you know like 
you're worried about, I might not know everything and, you know, I got to be prepared and which is the right, I think a good mindset to have, like, don't go in thinking, you know, everything cause mm-hmm. you'll be the stupidest guy in the room, you know? Um, but also like, don't let that fear of not knowing everything, uh, stop you from just, you know, fucking sending it. Yeah. Like if you get, if you got it, you do, you know, life's short, you know, I can get hit by a bus tomorrow. So if you've got an idea and you put it out, like put it out today, you know, do it. Yeah. Obviously, if you think you want to polish it and, you know, like things like that, like, oh, I can make this title a little bit neater, this transition in this video. Like, yeah, obviously, you know, take the time to do it. But as far as afraid to, you know, take a chance on something or apply to something or do something like, nah, man, I'm telling you right now, just, just do it. Like I've been in, uh, just my life experiences. I've been in rooms with people that are so much more wealthier than me with so much more, you know, years of doing whatever they've been doing that I like looked up to, you know, like, holy crap. And then you see there and you're like behind the scenes and you're like, wait, hold on a minute. Like they, they're still kind of learning as they go too. Mm -hmm. you know, they've just learned to sometimes mask it better yeah, and not show it. Um, you know, and it also goes to like, it's sometimes it's employers. Like we we make the joke all the time. Like you gotta be 23 with 30 years of experience. Like it doesn't, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I have the, I have the two jobs, uh, my two radio jobs, but before that I applied to like every radio station I could find, like the Hudson Valley. And I got an interview with one and I went in and I'm talking with the guy and he's like, Oh, do you think you could run this board here? And I'm like, yeah, like I, I, I honestly, I think I could, but you know, I would need training. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know, you know, what is the input on every board? Like obviously the buttons can be reassigned. I, you know, I would need a little bit of time, but I think if you get, if you gave me the shot, I, yes, I would be able to do this. And he's like, well, I run this by myself. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to be here to babysit. And I'm like, okay, I wouldn't need a babysitter. I would need to be trained. You know, there's a difference. I don't need you here. I need to be trained for two, three weeks to teach me how to do this. And then you can, you know, and then the girl who interviewed me was like the finance manager. So I'm applying for a board op position and possibly a jock position. And the finance manager was interviewing me. So I'm like, why, what the fuck does she know about what I'm going to do? She doesn't do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so then I get the interview, uh, I get the job at, uh, Pamel and I talk to the guy and I'm like, yeah, like I've, I've interned at radio stations so with basically it's just shadowing. Like I wasn't able to touch the board. I basically just had to sit back and watch and shut up. And he's like, okay, you know, uh, no, no, we'll train with Jimmy. Jimmy will show you the board and the whole only thing. And I was like, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You yeah. know what I mean? Now, if I had pissed it away and not learned anything, that's on me. Yeah. You know? But I was like, all right, I get the shot now. Like I'm going to soak up everything I can. But, you know, I, I think for you, like if this, as far as like, even like a documentary of the podcast, like don't obviously be open to learning and, you know, like take everything in, but also don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. Like just do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when I did my internship, I like, I hated the fact that the guy was, he was like at the interview he was like, you know, it's not really like a holding, a holding your hand kind of internship. Like we're really going to expect you to know what you're doing. And I like I don't feel like that's a good internship environment because yeah you want to be able to to maybe make a mistake here and there yeah and you want to be able to, the guy to teach you something but it always seemed like the the he was the kind of guy that wanted you to learn yourself and that kind of gave me some bad vibes so yeah right I think you definitely yeah I, I go ahead I think you definitely I mean it's hard to just like throw yourself in i mean obviously you needed that for school right yeah so like now that you're kind of out of school and stuff you can i think you have more leeway to if you go somewhere and you feel that it's not right right like right off the bat you don't have to stay there i mean i know like jobs might say like oh why do you have like five or six of these like different things on your resume but it's like if that wasn't the right fit i'm looking for the right fit you know Mm -hmm. like for me kind of like I, I've been blessed because I'm working with my friends. I'm working with a great boss. Um, aside from actually just doing the video work or any of that aspect. So I, I, I have that comfortability of working with somebody I've known for 20 years, you know? So that is where I make most of my income. And like, 
there's a lot of passion projects that I'll have that like kind of then you have to segue into around your work schedule and around other things. But I mean, as far as like the fear aspect too, like I go into, into different jobs and like, I have like almost like that butterfly butterfly feeling like, do I know enough? But you kind of just have to keep on like doing with the repetitions, repetitions, like kind of train your mind into like, you know, this stuff going in. But like still, you you can still be open to learning, obviously. I mean, I came out of college not knowing what a C-stand C is out of, out of St. John's. So the I first, the, the first, I went on like an independent uh, film. Um, I got hired for like a PA job right off, uh, like for like a couple, it was like four or five weeks. And the first day, the one director was like, can you go get me a C-stand? I was like, yeah, sure. And I was, and then like, I just walked away kind of thing. And I was like, that it clicked. I was like, I don't know what the fuck a C-stand is. He's like, shit, 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 shit. So then I went to like another, one of the other PAs. And I was like, yo, what's a C-stand? And then he was like, oh, it's that shiny, shiny uh, pole thing over there kind of thing. But it's like, I also have like that, not that I don't want to ask in a sense, but like in the past, I've I've not wanted to ask Almost like that that fear aspect of not knowing. So I've just kind of tried to train where it's like you can't be afraid to like ask the questions if you don't know. Because then you're going to look stupid if you go, if I would have went and grabbed something else and been like, here's your C-stand. Like it just looks bad on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think asking questions is always the most important part, but yet it's the one thing you fear the most. Because you just mm -hmm. don't really want to look like a moron. But like you said, that's that's a great point. That like, would you rather just do it wrong or do it right the first time by just asking? And I think certain people might get into that mindset of having like that fear of talking where, or like asking a question because of the repercussions. When there's other people who I know who will just ask every single question. Like back in, and this was me my whole life. Like back in high school, I never wanted to ask questions. I never wanted to ask answer questions. But like I knew the answers. Like when people would be like, when a teacher would be like, what's the answer? And then like nobody would, nobody would say it. And I would just be there thinking in my mind, like the answer. It's kind of just been that way my whole life in a sense. So you kind of have to get out of your own head and retrain it to be where you want in a sense. Well said. Thank you. But I think we are ending up on that that time frame. I gotta gotta go eat because I'm I'm starving, and I know I think Steve has a couple things to do. Gotcha. But Dixon, if you want to just plug work. plug your uh, your podcast and everything, yeah, follow us at Children's Programming. That's Children's with an S at the end. Programming, usual spelling uh, on shout Instagram. Out, that's our out. main. Shh. That's our main place to find us. Um, and you can also find us at CHI Ch Programming everywhere else. Um, you can subscribe to us. We upload our uh, episodes usually every Friday, sometimes Monday. Um, you can find us everywhere on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you know, the usual places. Um, just ask your mom. She'll be able to yeah, find you. She'll be able to find you a little podcast place. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give a and, special uh, shout out to Nick Parodies. Cause, uh, shout out my dope, mom. Shout out Nick Parody's dope, dope, dope dude. Yeah, Nick Parody is a great guy. Um, yeah, I can't wait to have him back uh, in person so we can do. We're gonna do some movie commentaries. That's gonna be our next big thing. We're gonna watch some. I'm looking uh, forward to that. I feel like you and him together with that will be very good. Yeah, we've had some. We have some good things in mind. We'll definitely have to have you guys on for one. We could probably watch some uh, some good stuff. I want to be on your podcast. You're always yeah, welcome so. on our podcast. Just tell me. We yeah, record we on what? Tuesdays we and Thursdays on we there. record. All right. Let me know. Let us know. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yeah. Usually uh, we can we can adapt, but it just can't be a Wednesday because that's date that's date night. That's fine. Okay. Thursday would be the better day. All right. We'll talk off the air about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So also, just, shout out. Uh, um, shout out Talia. Yes. Check out her podcast, Talia yes. Talks. Yep. Oh, I remember Talia. I just yeah. listened to yeah, Talia. That, that, yeah, that, yeah. She's it's it's short, short, sweet episodes, and they're very inspirational. So I'm looking forward to watching that content. Cool. No, sorry, not watching, listening to that. Listening. Content. Sorry, I always I'm I'm I got that video frame of, of mine. 
video frame of mine. That make a great T-shirt for you, Chris Kelly. You you know what? You, that make that a great right? T-shirt for you. Right, video video frame of uh, mind. Okay, I'm writing that down. Oh my god! Now he's gonna have iconic visions video frame of mind. Hell like yeah. I put an iconic everything visions iconic on every visions conceivable object. Branded everywhere with everything. <laughs> I want that on a new era fitted. That's my next uh, my, my next goal in life is to have an iconic Visions new era fitted. I have to get a new era hat first. Well, you know they got you gotta have you gotta have the new eras. That's, that's the best way to go. Yeah, we gotta get a sponsorship. Yes. Um, but yes, gents, this was very fun. Uh, you are both always welcome on the podcast. Um, we will schedule yeah. something to have you on there as soon as possible. Yeah, we we appreciate uh, that invite. We appreciate your your uh, perspective on things. Yes, and we look forward to all of the uh, the dope work. And when things open up, we definitely I'm I'm excited to to get back to interviewing people. Well, I don't I think I've, I've hung that. out with Steve in about six years, so it'd be nice to do that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> all good. So <laughs> it would be nice to do that. Yes. I agree. Just sit down, have a nice, you know, non-alcoholic beverage. It'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, oh, a nice drink. That would yes. definitely a be. nice ginger ale. Yes, yeah. a nice ginger oh. ale. I Chris, haven't had soda in Chris over Seagram's. in close to a year. So good job. Keep it up. Hey, good for you, man. I'm trying to do another year of that. I did that in 2018. Here's, so here's what I'll say about that. I don't consider ginger ale a soda, even though unfortunately by all I means do. it is. No, I know. I know. I yo, I used to be a huge, huge soda drinker. Yeah. Like multiple cans a day. You wanna know what helped me break it? What's up? Like the only time I drink soda now is like if I'm drinking alcohol. Mm-hmm. My replacement, cranberry juice. Worked wonders. I don't think it that's any great. better because it's full of sugar. I know. Shh, but shh. don't let don't 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 I, take this away from him. Do you are but you But then from cranberry juice I went to like seltzer and then from seltzer i went to water i drink I, so now mostly all now, the, now drink he drinks this, flavor this now he's, right now so yes that's, that works for me <laughs> the sh- strawberry with caffeine crystal light yes oh yeah it's great it does wonders i don't I think don't it actually hope. boosts me up but yeah can i just tell you I, I told steve about this but the podcast that i i started recently getting into is two bears uh one k yes with uh like burton Bert, uh and, and uh, Tom. Tom, yeah, and literally that man has a gallon of Kool Aid. I know. I, we were, I was the, listening to that last week. It was the craziest thing. Like, how do you drink a gallon of Kool Aid a day? Who, Bert? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. He's such an animal, man. Yeah. His new era game is on point. Oh yeah, he's got it. But I was, I was just watching that. Episode. I was like, oh my god, that's so much sugar. It's not healthy. No. So. I mean, I mean, he's not the healthiest human being, but he's he's still pretty damn funny. <laughs> he's the fucking man. I yeah. love him. So, all right, gents, I'll let you go eat. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Text me a little bit later. I want to know what was wrong with my with my audio or Nick's audio. So, sounds good. <laughs> all right, bye. all right, buddy. Yes, sir. Later. Peace. Peace and grease, everybody. I'm going to send you the audio. All right. Peace.